in her doctoral research. She focused on evaluating the efficiency of Bayesian hypothesis testing using inequality constraints. She is interested in developing and applying methods for evidence synthesis of replication or multiple data sources. So without further ado, here's Fayette talking about using our STEM. Thank you, Christian. Uh, let me just go ahead and pull my screen up again. Uh, yeah, so hi, everyone. Um, this talk I've developed on uh, just having a fairly hands-on introduction into using our STAN. Um, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer questions that are coming up throughout the talk, but please post them in the chat. And, and if it's just an, a, an unclarity, then uh, I think Nicole and Christian can, uh, can handle them. And if not, uh, we, can, uh, we can discuss them uh, uh, in, in the talk itself. Um, yeah, so uh, using our stand, uh, just before I'm actually gonna go into, into our stand itself, just because it is a Bayesian soft, uh, software tool, uh, I'm gonna give a very brief introduction into Bayesian statistics for those of you who are completely unfamiliar with what it is. Um, for any further and deeper uh, insights into what the Bayesian statistics is and what you can do with it, I have, uh, yeah, I highly, highly suggest that you uh, learn more about that, but that's not the purpose of this talk. Uh, and so like, after that intro, uh, I'll just give an introduction on what STAN and what R STAN are specifically, and then uh, walk you through like a, a workflow and um, things that you can consider while troubleshooting working with R STAN. At the end of uh, the talk, I'll have a live demonstration of uh, just a very simple uh, model that you can use with R STAN, and then uh, we can get to any questions. So what is Bayesian statistics? Bayesian statistics relies, um, uh, <laughs> at the core relies on a Bayes theorem, which is uh, shown here on, this, on the slide. Uh, and Bayes theorem is um, a conditional probability uh, theorem where we uh, have the probability of the data given a parameter, which you can also say is the likelihood of the data, uh, which you can uh, update with the probability of a probability uh, of a parameter, a prior distribution, uh, and uh, divided by the marginal distribution of the data, P of D, to get a posterior distribution, the probability of a parameter value given the data. The actual equation that we see here in Bayes theorem is just a conditional probability um, equation. Uh, and so the, the implementation of uh, using the D and the theta data and a parameter value are just how we use it actually in statistics. So what this really in, in words uh, boils down to is that we're combining some prior knowledge about parameters, about theta, which we quantify in P of theta, the prior distribution, uh, to be able to learn about the posterior, the conditional probability of theta given the data. Why is this conditional probability something interesting? It is actually a, a different quantity that we can get that we, rather than the one we would get in a frequentist statistical framework. In a frequentist statistical framework, we are evaluating the likelihood of the data given a set of parameters. And as you can see again, in a Bayesian framework, we are uh, getting the likelihood of the uh, parameters given uh, the observed data which is a much more intuitive and truly uh, sound uh, way of uh, esti uh, estimating and uh, driving uh, inference about your data. So because the probability of your data is not truly something that you're interested in, you're interested in what is the probability of, these para of the parameter values, which parameter values can we expect? A second nice feature of Bayesian statistics is that you can actually include prior information if you have particular information about certain parameters, for example, uh, that parameters cannot take on particular values or that, they, uh, or that you have already a strong uh, suspicion of what the values are, you can incorporate that in a prior distribution. And that means that you, it's easier to accumulate evidence across research because you can be including pri prior findings. And then a final reason uh, why you would want to use Bayesian statistics is that just because of the way uh, we're defining the model, uh, we can 
uh, facilitate uh, fitting quite complex models just because we are incre including prior information, uh, we're decreasing the complexity of a model. Imagine if you're having a regression uh, equation and um, the regression uh, coefficient can be can take up any value in a statistic in a in a frequentist analysis. But if I now put on a prior and says that says the regression coefficient can only be positive, for example, I have reduced the the, the complexity of this model by half. I'm limiting the the parameter space where I'm considering my solutions. And this in the extremes when we're having much more complicated models with many more parameters helps uh, to actually like uh, get um, complex models to fit better. A very, very brief example of how Bayesian statistics works uh, in practice is uh, say we're flipping a, a coin uh, 10 times and uh, we have seven times heads come up. Now, what do we now learn about this coin? If I'm just looking at the data, I'm saying, well, seven out of 10 means that I think that the probability of heads is a 0.7. And I can do a frequentist analysis that says, uh, that describes the probability of uh, uh, the data observing uh, seven heads, given that I assume uh, that it's a fair coin. In a Bayesian framework, I can actually quantify my prior, my prior assumptions about how fair this coin is. And in this particular example for a coin where we're doing a repeated example, uh, repeated um, experiment, a repeated trial, um, we can actually this is a, uh, we can actually very easily uh, compute this, where we can specify a prior distribution in the form of a beta distribution. Now the beta has a very nice intuitive way of looking at it. A beta of ten ten basically means can boils down to me saying, oh, in the past, I've seen this coin come up 10 times heads and 10 times tails. So that's how often I've conducted this experiment. I am that certain that it is a fair coin. And you see that plotted out in the orange line. That's the pro my prior distribution. The blue point is now my data, which was seven out of 10 heads. And so what you see in the red line is how we have in, in improved our knowledge prior distribution with our data to a posterior distribution. Now you see that the posterior mean is not 0.7, just because our prior mean was centered around 0.5. So we've shifted our posterior distribution slightly uh, by combining this prior information uh, where we've observed, in essence, 20 head coin, uh, 20 flip, coin flips uh, that came out fair uh, with our new experiment. I could also have specified a much stronger prior where I say, well, I have not seen 10 and 10 heads and tails, but I've seen 100 and 100. And now you see the orange line is much steeper, much more narrow. That means that I'm much more certain that it's a fair point, I, a priori. As you see that the, the data point is actually like outside of what I would have considered uh, to be likely at all. And the stereo distribution shifts very slightly. I'm just saying, I don't believe this data much more than I did my prior information. I could also have said, I don't know anything about this coin. I've never seen it before. Um, so I'm just, it could, it could take on any number of heads and, uh, and tails. And so now we see that the, the posterior distribution is fully informed by our data point. Finally, I could also have uh, devised a prior distribution that says that I'm already suspecting this coin to be unfair, uh, which is like this orange uh, prior distribution here. And we're uh, thereby updating our prior and confirming that we think it's an unfair coin. So this is just a very brief example that shows you, uh, I think quite a big difference between frequentist and uh, Bayesian statistics, where in frequentist statistics, we would only be looking at this particular point. And our best estimate is that the, the, the probability of heads is 0.7, and we would have just uncertainty around that. And Bayesian statistics allows us to not only specify where we expect parameter values to be a priori, but also uh, how uncertain we are about that uh, prior expectation. Now, this was a very simple example, but uh, models can get complex quite quickly, of course, because this was just a single parameter. Um, 
And many, very often we will have many more parameters than just a single one. And while in this particular example, I could just derive the posterior distribution uh, very easily, um, that's not always true. And so we need to uh, find another way uh, to, to obtain information about this posterior distribution. This is often done in an iterative sampling procedure, um, generally an MCMC type of, uh, uh, of sampling. Uh, where, and, and, and a key feature about MCMC sampling in this case would be that we're determining the probability of, uh, we're, we're sampling from the uh, conditional posterior distribution. On the figure on the right, you see a little bit of an example of how this would go. If I have two parameter values, I will first determine uh, what is the pos conditional posterior probability of parameter value two. Uh, I, will, I will just choose an initial value. And now I will determine what is the posterior probability of uh, the first parameter given the data and the second parameter that I've chosen as an initial value. Now I've updated my prediction of what I think is a good value for parameter number one. Now I will do the same thing for parameter value two, for parameter two, where I use the just previously uh, best expectation of parameter value one, and now update my, uh, my sample of uh, parameter value two. And so as you see, this value gets plugged in here, and this data one one gets used here. Now in the second iteration, I'm using this data two one to again update my best guess of, uh, of data one. This means that uh, uh, it's, it's important or like in, in some situations it can matter at which part of the, uh, the sampling space you start out. Say I'm starting out at negative a thousand. It could be that then the best value of data one is negative 999, which in case of the simple regression model where we're, for example, um, estimating uh, the effect of IQ on, um, uh, on some test score um, is, is not, in, in any case, the, the, the type of regression coefficient values that we would be expecting. So if we're just choosing the initial values more in the, in the range of values that we would be uh, expecting the value to be, that can improve the sampling. Now, this, this was a very basic uh, introduction on like what, how, how we need uh, to, to be sampling uh, from a posterior distribution. And there are many different ways uh, that are uh, more and more complex in which we can get estimates of posterior distribution. So the very, the very first example I showed you is a direct specification of the posterior. We can only do this for very simple models, generally only with a single parameter. The second we are having more um, coefficients, uh, there is uh, an algorithm that's called GIP sampling, which uses an MCMC algorithm. This is actually implemented in quite some other software. If, you, if you're using Bayesian statistics already, you might actually be using a software that uses uh, GIP sampling. For example, JAGS and BUX, the G is standing for GIP sampling. Now, GIP sampling is, uh, very nice if, uh, again, your model is not too complicated. Um, but when you have highly correlated variables, uh, parameters, or um, a, a big, a large model, uh, large data sets, uh, the GIP sampler can uh, uh, be suboptimal in exploring the posterior distribution. And so the Metropolis Hastings algorithm is, again, something that you will find uh, is uh, an added feature to. Uh, to sampling algorithms um, that is able to explore the posterior distribution um, more uh, uh, throughout. However, it's a time in intensive uh, algorithm um, and it's, yeah, you need, you need some extra specifications for that. Now, Hem Hamilton and Monte Carlo is uh, another way of um, sampling from the posterior distribution. And that is actually the routine that's implemented in SAN. What Hamiltonian Monte Carlo does is, it use, is it, that it uses the gradient of the unnormalized log posterior distribution. 
Now, this is, uh, yeah, there's, there's quite an uh, elaborate uh, mathematical proof of how uh, this works. And it's not something that's easy uh, to implement yourself. While a Gibbs sampler that uses just the a closed form of the conditional posterior is something that you can fairly easily program yourself. Uh, and then the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is getting uh, fairly quickly quite elaborate to program yourself. Hence, uh, the use of uh, Stan that has implemented this routine. And so really what this does it is, is it tries to, for a particular sample in the posterior distribution, it tries to evaluate what is the gradient of that posterior distribution. And from there, decide whether it wants to, uh, in which direction it should move for the next iteration, preferably to a higher uh, dense uh, posterior uh, likelihood. In addition to the HMC algorithm, there's also the no U-turn sampler, which is again an added feature on top of the uh, the HMC. Just like Metropolis Hastings is also an added uh, component. And the no U-turn sampler is, um, yeah, basically a feature that improves the uh, efficiency or actually decreases the amount of control you need to uh, exert on the HMC algorithm. It, uh, it is an auto-tuning uh, routine. So in Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, you would need to specify uh, the number of leapfrog steps, which is um, a part of the equation to determine the gradient. Um, and now the, the no U-turn sampler both um, uh, determines itself how many samples for that need to be taken and ensures that uh, yeah, in that process, um, there's no uh, going back down the gradient. A final um, approach that I wanted to point out, um, but that is uh, uh, slightly different from the previous uh, approaches is uh, an optimization routine. Now, all of the previous methods um, are actually sampling from the posterior distribution itself. Uh, meaning that we are actually getting not just a point estimate, but we're getting a whole distribution for that parameter value. There are very different various optimization routines that are trying just to maximize the objective function of the posterior distribution. And that means that they're trying to get to the, the point estimate, the, high, the, the posterior uh, median of the uh, distribution. That means that you're not getting uncertainty intervals if you're using an optimization routine. Whereas if you're sampling from a full posterior, you're also getting uncertainty about your um, conditional probability density. So with that <laughs> a very brief introduction into uh, Bayesian statistics and um, the need for having uh, statistical software that does sampling procedures for you, uh, we, move, we get into R stand. So I already uh, hinted at this when I introduced just now the, the sampling algorithms, uh, is that we have a Hamiltonian Monte Carlo and the no-turn U-turn sampler, uh, which uh, are not easy to program yourself and are fairly uh, complex mathematical systems. Now, Stan is a, a C++ language that has integrated these two uh, routines. It's developed by uh, Hoffman and Gelman et al. Um, and is maintained by the Stan for development team. So this is an open source uh, software uh, and uh, is written in C++. So if you want to use just Stan, you need to know C++. And so that is where our Stan comes in. Uh, which it makes, which is an R interface uh, for the STAN software. So if you're using R STAN, be aware that you're actually using another software program behind the, under the hood of R. Um, and so uh, you need to have a C++ compiler because the actual, what really what R STAN does, it is it, it converts the, the R code that you write into a C++ uh, script that is then uh, run behind the screens. So this is already, I think, uh, step number one, if you are uh, interested in uh, using uh, RSTAN, is the installation of RSTAN is not uh, a simple click of a button generally. Um, for one, like I said, you need the installation of a C++ compiler. 
some computers will come default by this. For some, you would need to install or update that. And then in addition, you need several uh, R packages to be installed. Um, all of it uh, has been described uh, on, on various uh, uh, pages on the internet, and particularly the installation of Arsene itself has quite some elaborate documentation. But it's good to be mindful uh, that if anything goes wrong in the installation, it might be worthwhile uh, deleting everything and starting over. Um, why would you use R stand to begin with? Well, I think uh, we've 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 gotten to that. Um, we're by using R stand, we're gaining a lot of speed and efficiency um, from the HMC and the nut samplers which uh, bo both of these are just a lot more efficient in exploring the posterior distribution and uh, getting both to the, uh, also to the, the lower probability densities of uh, complex models. Uh, neither of these you can get with like, uh, to, to the same extent with a Gibbs sampler or a Metropolis Hastings sampler. Secondly, uh, you have the ability now to specify and fit very complex models just using an R script uh, or um, a stand script uh, that you wrote within R. Uh, you get the ease of model of writing a model in R and uh, but you have to specify it in a stand file. So you have to use um, some stand code, um, but you that will generate the actual C++ code that's being uh, run behind the screen, which is a lot more complex even. So it's a very fairly minimal learning curve uh, to be uh, able to like run quite complex models. I wanted to take a little second here because I think I've gone over uh, quite a lot of uh, um, material about Bayesian statistics. If there's anything unclear about why would we want to do a Bayesian model and particularly in our stand, I'm happy to. Uh, to take any questions at this moment. If not, I will uh, move forward. So you have a model that you want to fit and that you want to do some estimation for using Bayesian statistics. Um, what what do you need to do? You've downloaded you've downloaded our stand and now uh, you've uh, you have it uh, installed in your computer. Uh, we, we first need to actually formulate the statistical model and we need to write that down into a .stand file. Uh, that's a specific, we, we just, instead of a file that you would have a .r or a .txt file, the file extension needs to be .stan. And now in our studio, there's an actual um, yeah, lang uh, language checker for stan uh, that will actually is able to uh, give you a little bit of feedback on whether you've written the script uh, correctly. Um, so from the statistical model, we want to sample from a posterior distribution. That you do again in, uh, in an R file using the stand function, which is just an R function uh, that uses that stand model file. Then you get to more uh, practical Bayesian uh, statistic issues like assessing convergence, um, and running rendering plots and diagnostics, and then finally you draw your inference. Now I'm hopefully going to focus most on uh, step one and two. I think step three is um, if you know Bayesian statistics, you know uh, what things are important to look out for in convergence. Uh, if you don't know Bayesian statistics yet, I highly recommend uh, learning a little bit more about Bayesian statistics uh, before uh, moving on to a step like step three, uh, where you where you actually have to evaluate whether your model fits well. So what does a STAN model file look like? I've uh, copied it here below. So this is really just uh, the, the script that I have in a file uh, that would be a model.stan file. And this particular um, code will always consist of a couple of different sections. Um, at the top, we have an optional section, which is called functions, where you can define and specify your own functions, very much like you would also specify your own function in R. You can actually also do that within a stand program. 
this is Stan actually has quite an extensive uh, function library. It has its own distributions all implemented, and all of these are documented into the Stan uh, user guide. Um, but sometimes uh, Stan might not have a particular function, um, perhaps a uh, delay distribution that you want to put over your data, and you can actually uh, specify it right here. As I've indicated here, this is an optional section, so we could also omit uh, this entire section. Then we have the, the section data, which is a required section, and this is where you specify what type of data is this model um, expect, uh, expecting to, uh, to receive from the user. We'll go to an example of how this looks in practice in the, in the next slide. The next section is transformed data, so if you want to do any um, manipulations on your data, um, if you just want to add 10 to all of your data points, um, or you want to make a derivative of some data, uh, you do that in the transformed sec data section. This is again an optional section, which can be omitted. The next section is the parameter section, and that is where you need to define and specify which parameters are used in your statistical model. Similar to the transform data, we can also have a transform parameters section where we can uh, get uh, transformations of our parameters. For example, if we're having some residual variance model, the sigma uh, squared, uh, we could also get the transformation here and get um, the precision by, trans by computing one over the variance. Now, we also have a section called model, and that's a required uh, section, and that is where we actually define the statistical model and any prior distributions that we're specifying. That combined is the full model that is being evaluated. And then finally, we have another optional section called generated quantities, uh, in which you can just calculate any particular um, uh, combinations of parameters and or data uh, that is just being computed once after the full model is being run. So if we just use a very simple uh, uh, statistical model to actually write the code uh, for uh, in a stand program. So let's consider a simple linear regression model where we have a single predictor X and a single outcome variable Y. Uh, so we see that y can be uh, written as, um, fun as a function of uh, b0, an intercept, b1, a regression coefficient, times uh, the predictor variable x, and we have some uh, residual errors. Now, we also can say uh, y hat, the, prediction, the predicted value of y is just uh, the intercept and the regression uh, coefficient and the uh, predictor. And then finally, we have um, an assumption about how the errors are distributed. In particular, we assume a normal, um, a normal error distribution with a mean of zero and a variance of sigma squared. Reversely, we can also, we can write this in many different ways. So we could also say we expect y to be normally, distribu normally distributed with a mean of y hat and a variance of, um, Sigma squared. So how would this model look in stand code? So this particular uh, uh, script has first a definition of the data that we expect. So uh, here we see we have an integer n, which is specifying the number of data points. Uh, then we're having a vector, uh, which is linked n uh, that we call y, and a vector n that we call x. So right in this very first block, you see a very specific feature of uh, a stand code that you need. It's different than R where you can just say, oh, uh, N equals uh, uh, N is assigned with the number uh, 10. We actually need to specify that N is an integer by uh, writing down INT. And we need to specify that Y is a vector um, with a particular length. So this is uh, an inheritance of, uh, uh, of C++. And so uh, because C++ needs to know these particular uh, uh, features of the data, we also need to specify it here in the stand code. Um, 
So what this first block means is that uh, this model code is expecting you to give it a list um, with something named n that is an integer and with two, uh, two vectors that are called y and x that are exactly the length uh, of that specific integer. Now for the parameters, we also need to specify again the type of value that we expect these param that these parameters should be. Now, in this particular case, we're having regression coefficients and um, a residual variance. Uh, and we're all expecting these to be um, uh, real numbers so they can take on any value. I've included here a transform parameters block uh, where I specify a vector of length n called theta. I could have called it uh, y hat. I think I defined it as y hat in the previous slide, uh, where I say uh, theta equals uh, b0 plus b1 uh, times the uh, predictor. So this is a transformation. This is fully defined by uh, both the data that we've already provided and uh, the parameter values that will be estimated. So this is, that is why this is a transformed parameter. Now, finally, in the, in the last lines, we have the actual model statement where we say that y is uh, normally distributed with a mean of data, this y hat value here, and sigma, uh, with a, and a variance of uh, sigma. And I'm very sorry that I've dropped the, uh, the sigma 2 notation uh, for variance. So here is again a recap of uh, what I think I've all mentioned uh, as I went along this, uh, where we say that uh, we need to specify all the data that we're feeding into the model. Uh, we have to specify all the model parameters um, and we have to, yeah, we can compute transform parameters and we include uh, our model statement. So I'm very, yeah, okay. So the different types of uh, uh, unit variables that exist in SAN um, are uh, like I've already introduced an int, which is there for integer, a real, which is um, a real uh, valued number, a vector, which is always assumed to be a vector of real numbers. And SAN also knows a matrix and it, uh, uh, so you can actually also define a, a full matrix. Um, in either any, any of the blocks. Another feature that you have uh, access to is to specify limits. Right here, I've done it for int and then between the uh, uh, open and closed uh, brackets, uh, we, say, we say lower equals zero. That means that we specify that n is never going to be lower than zero. Meaning that if I now uh, insert um, some data where n is specified as negative two, uh, Stan will reject it uh, and say, well, that's not allowed. Um, I was expecting a value that was larger than zero. Um, similarly, uh, uh, just a, a coding uh, a feature that is accessible in Stan is uh, a for loop, just like we, uh, we know in R as well. So we can just specify a for loop of looping over uh, every single um, individual in our uh, data vectors. And we can actually, instead of just doing the vectorized uh, likelihood evaluation, we can also evaluate the likelihood for each individual separately, which is what we're doing here. Another uh, important feature to be uh, aware of when you're writing stand code is that you have to end each statement with a semicolon. Um, yeah, that's just uh, a necessity. So like I mentioned, RSTAN actually has um, a check uh, to check the correctness of your code. Uh, and when we get to the live demonstration, I think we will, uh, I can show that this is sometimes informative and uh, sometimes not so much. But generally what will happen is that if you've missed a semicolon, for example, you will see a little pop up and perhaps the warning message might not be informative, but at least you will get an indication that some, something might be missing in your code. So it's good to, uh, to be aware of that. Now, I've uh, shown you one way that I can uh, formulate this model into STAN. And um, there's actually many different alternative formulations that you can have just with the basic set of uh, 
tools that uh, we have at our at our uh, availability now. So instead of specifying a particular uh, int n, the number of data points, I can also say that the data that is expected is just length 30. Um, yeah, similarly, uh, like I uh, said before, we can specify a, a limit on uh, uh, particular values. And because sigma squared is never going to be uh, uh, lower than zero, we don't expect any negative variance. This say that uh, this is a real that has a lower limit of zero. Specifically for parameters, this is useful information. For the data, it's actually a way that when you specify your model, Stan will check whether your data fits what you said it should be. When you're specifying limits for parameter values, you're making sure that Stan is not sampling values that are impossible. Uh, yeah, on this slide, I have yet another um, another way of writing down the same uh, code, uh, and that is that now instead of uh, listing and transform parameters, uh, this this equation for theta, I'm actually specifying it in the model statement. Now, what the difference is between specifying it in the model versus in the transform parameters is that when I specify it in the model, I'm just using it internally within the model. It's just a shorthand for not having to write down uh, here, where I write down theta, b0 plus b1 equal, uh, times x. Once I write this particular statement in transform parameters, Stan expects that I want to do inference on this, and it will give me the actual samples as output. When I write it in the model, Stan assumes that I was just writing this as a shorthand, and I will not be feedback uh, uh, outputted any um, samples from this data. Now, also again, in it, originally I uh, wrote down the model using uh, the tilde and the normal uh, function within Stan, but Stan also has actual the uh, the log posterior density functions coded out, and so this is yet another way in which I could write down uh, this model where I'm saying target and target is a um, a special uh, uh, word. Uh, in Stan, meaning that it is it is actually like dedicated to your target log posterior value. And what you're saying by by this particular line is saying increase the log the target log likelihood in each iteration with the normal likelihood the normal log posterior density evaluated with the data and this particular set of parameter values. Finally, I've included um, a, another distribution right here, um, where I've now included a, a prior distribution for sigma. As you saw in this model, I did not specify any prior distributions for any of my parameters, in which case, when I do that, Rstan actually will assume um, a, uh, a non-informative um, vague prior. If I want to specify any particular uh, uh, prior distribution specifically, I will need to specify it in the model statement. So just summing that up uh, a little bit, um, any quantity that is specified in the parameter section is being sampled from the posterior distribution and is being assumed either there's either a prior assumed for it or it, the prior that is specified will be used for that value. Um, there's a question in the chat. Yeah. Will different articulations of the model change the set of sampled parameters? Yeah, no, it should not. As long as they are equivalent, uh, they should not change the actual uh, set of samples um, other than uh, the seat being used, of course um because we are sampling so if the seat changes uh the posterior samples will change um but uh y till the normal is exactly equivalent to target plus equals normal lpdf
Uh, yeah, so any, any uh, parameter value is sampled, and for that, we assume a, a prior distribution or have to specify a prior distribution. Any quantity in transform parameters is being sampled from the posterior, but that is using the actual samples of the parameter values, and therefore it's only being computed as a secondary step. So this whole stand model script is being iteratively through multiple iterations uh, evaluated and the log posterior value is being incremented for each model, uh, for each uh, iteration. I'm sorry, this is uh, incorrect <laughs> for each iteration. Um, and like I mentioned, if we're not writing down prior and likelihoods for parameters, uh, default improper priors are uh, being used. So we've seen now how the, 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 script, the stand script looks, um, but how can we actually now uh, use that within R? It's um, not that complicated actually. So what we need is uh, we need to load the library R stand and we need to actually define the data that we uh, had listed in our, in our model file. So we have N and we have an X, the predictor variable and Y an outcome variable. I'm just generating data for like the full regression uh, here. So we also actually have the residuals uh, to generate uh, this Y variable. I'm now creating a list of the data, uh, uh, the, da the different data points, uh, and I'm, I'm naming them exactly as I've specified them in uh, the, the stand model code. So particularly the N, the X and the Y here have to match uh, what the stand model script is, uh, is expecting. And then here for in lines nine to 20, we actually have the, 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 the function call to uh, uh, the stan uh, code. I've already mentioned that the actual function itself is just stan. And what we need stan uh, to direct to is uh, the location file where we have this model script uh, located. So here I've just, uh, this is in my current working directory is where the file is, but you need to be of course, specifying the exact file location here. We want to inform Stan, and, and then we want to inform Stan of uh, what the data is that you're feeding into the model, which is here example one data that I defined on line seven. Now, all the rest of these lines that I've included here are uh, optional. So these all are, are all having defaults within the Stan functions. So you would, you would be fine just only specifying the Stan file and the data. But I wanted to show you these features just because these are, I think, the most useful uh, features to be having at your uh, uh, availability. The first one is the number of chains. So as we, as as I discussed, this that uh, uh, the sampling is an iterative procedure and is dependent on the actual uh, initial starting values that you that you use. A common approach in Bayesian estimation uh, is that we're using different chains. So we're uh, and that means that we're using different, a different set of starting values, in this case, four different sets. And from each different starting point, we will let the whole iterative procedure run. We do this so that we can actually evaluate whether these, uh, these chains are nice overlapping and they're all exploring the same um, parts of the posterior distribution. And if they are in agreement, then we are more certain that we have actually converged on uh, the posterior distribution. The next two lines, warm up and iter, uh, are uh, the actual number of iterations being used in each of these chains. So warm up is, um, like it says, it's the warm up, uh, and that means that you're actually saying I'm giving the the, the sampler um, a thousand iterations time to make its way to the most uh, uh, likely regions of the posterior distribution. Um, uh, and then with uh, with either uh, you're saying the total number of iterations. So the difference between either and warm up is the actual number of iterations that are being used to create your posterior samples. The first thousand are just thrown away, and we do this just because our initial values might be completely off. We might have a very complex model, and that it takes some time to go over the gradients to get to the 
the more likely areas. Uh, then we have uh, the option of specifying the number of cores on the machine that you're running on. Uh, this is uh, uh, particularly useful if you're having large complex models where you can increase the number of, uh, of cores so that each chain could be run on its own core. And that just speeds up uh, the sampling procedure. And this slide is just summarizing again what I've, uh, what I've mentioned. Um, so I think I can just move on to the next slide. Further uh, features that you can include into the stand code are, for example, the seed. So you can actually specify a, a stand specific seed. So setting your seed in R is actually not having any effect into, into stand itself. Um, so you will not get the exact same results if you're specifying an R specific seed, but you will need to specify the seed within uh, the STAN uh, model code to get the exact same results. Uh, using the init option, you can actually provide uh, manual initial values. If you don't do that, the sampler will just automatically determine random initial values. Now, there are many, many more advanced options and uh, uh, yeah, different uh, settings available to you in both the stand functions. And there's also different ways of formulating this. Um, and so, yeah, that's all just, uh, I think, whenever you're having a model up and running, that's definitely the point in which you can uh, start learning more about uh, these various options. Um, but it's good to know that there's many different little buttons that are tweakable for a stand model uh, when you're writing it. I think I will actually, uh, I have a bunch of more slides on um, both uh, assessing convergence and on troubleshooting, but I think I will just move on to doing the live demonstration just to show how it goes in practice. And then um, I'm happy to share the slides uh, after as well so that people can go over this uh, at their own leisure. And so let me move on to the example. So I, I really just have the same example that I've just discussed in the, in the presentation uh, where we have uh, a data block, uh, parameters block, the transform um, parameters and the model. Yes. Uh, we can only see your PDF slides oh, right now. Thank you. I thought I had the whole desktop shared. <laughs> That's there we better. go. So we have the, uh, the same model script that we've seen before. So just to show you uh, what you can do is if you create a new file in uh, RStudio, you actually have an option uh, to create uh, a stand file. So just um, from the, not the options of new files that you can create, we can actually create an empty stand file. When you do that, you will see that it will also be already, it will already be pre-filled with the basic, the default blocks that, that are necessary and with some, some placeholders. It also gives you a link to uh, uh, useful links to, to get it started. So if you ever get lost and you open a file, you will just have a way of uh, finding your way back again here. So this is the .stand file that I've already pre-filled. And I just wanted to show you like what happens, for example, if I make mistakes. So here I've specified a vector, but I've not specified how long this vector is. And what happens is that I get a little pop-up in my RStudio uh, line indicator. And like I mentioned, this, this error is not particularly useful. It just says partial expected something. Um, but as you will find, generally this, this error is that you uh, likely forgot to specify a particular uh, part of um, uh, uh, an either a function call or um, uh, yeah, it, you specified an incorrect line. If I now say, if I, for example, would say that uh, n is a real number, I'm also getting an error. This is a little bit of more of a useful uh, error where we're seeing that um, 
it says that well we can we cannot have a real uh, valued number as a number indicating the number of items in a vector. So by that we need we know that n needs to be an integer. Um, yeah, so if we have this particular file saved, uh, we just go back again to the R script where we can generate our data. So we have uh, a vector of uh, values x and a vector of values y. And here we have the named list. So like I mentioned, the namings are actually like fairly important. If I messed up and I called this capital Y, my model would not work just because Stan is going to look through this little, through this uh, data list and it's looking for a lowercase y. Uh, so just be mindful that Stan is uh, capital sensitive, just like our studio is ours is, our is as well. So this is uh, again like I like I showed you. This is the, the actual uh, function call to uh, to Stan. And if I run this, uh, oh okay, sorry. I do. I need to set my working directory directory correctly. Uh, so this is what you're seeing if you're running uh, the script, and that is that. The, all of the code that's happening here is the actual transformation of your uh, of your data and the stand code into uh, C++ code. Let me just scroll back up to show it. So that's what's happening when you're seeing uh, these messages come up. If you have any error in your stand code that is not shown up to you before uh, with the errors here, it could be that the that the stand function will just error on compiling the model altogether, and you would get a, a, an error message um, right below um, the, the 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 log code, the logs um, of trying to convert it into C plus plus. And this would again be uh, likely due to like some um, misformulated uh, function call, um, some uh, data that's not in the correct format. Uh, not in the correct type that it's, that uh, Stan is expecting. But if the model conversion uh, went well, um, we're seeing the following um, feedbacks on uh, uh, on on our output file on our console, um, and we actually see that the model is starting to sample. So we're getting these these outputs per chain that is being sampled, and what we're seeing is a bunch of um, uh, log measure, uh, log outputs. So actually we're seeing that the first initial value that, that Stan came up with was projected. Um, they could, it couldn't be a, a log probability evaluated. And so actually Stan is like trying to get um, a correct initial value. In this particular case, it could have been that just the initial value was like way too far out because I did not specify any, any prior distributions or constraints on any of my parameters. So that could be that we have spent that the first value was a negative value of sigma, uh, and therefore um, it could not evaluate this likelihood. That's exactly what we're seeing right here. Luckily, after a few tries, uh, the initial value is being accepted, and then Stan is actually able to uh, move forward into the sampling procedure. Once it actually have have uh, a like uh, a correct value for sigma, it will only move away from the negative values just because the negative values of sigma are of course not like not likely by the model. And so once you're in a particular uh, in the, in the right area here, you will not run into this issue again. Again, for more complex models, this this could uh, <laughs> come back later again. Uh, and so therefore, again, this is a reminder to be mindful of specifying. Uh, limits wherever uh, uh, necessary. Now we saw that we got like some feedback as the it, the sampler was running, and we have at the very end all of the models uh, done, and we get an estimate on how long it took.
I now have an object that actually contains a summary of my uh, posterior samples. And that means that I now have estimates of uh, the posterior mean of my intercept, the posterior mean of my uh, regression coefficient, and of sigma. And nice as it is, we can actually confirm that the model was able to pretty well um, evaluate, uh, come back to the, the values that I had chosen, which was an intercept of 10 that generated the data, a regression coefficient of 5, and a residual variance of 1. Um, again, this is just because I've, of course, generated this data. Um, yeah. I think this is uh, this is it for the demonstration. Like this is a very simple example, of course, uh, with a minimal uh, linear regression. Uh, and so, the second you start building more complex models, your model file will become more complicated, and um, you will need to be more specific about your prior distributions and about uh, setting these limits. Um, but yeah, I hope that I have given you. Uh, a little bit of a, a useful insight into how you can get started with our stand and what you could be doing with it. Um, I, my personal opinion is that the documentation for our stand is really well. Uh, the user guide that's available online is is super useful and searchable. Um, so you will very easily be able to find examples of specific models that you're interested in. Many examples exist around, um, and so because every example is going to be so different, of course, uh, I think that's really uh, that should really be uh, be question driven. Yeah, um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, I'll stick around for a little bit if there are any. So I think there's this very interesting question that I've been fielding a little bit in the chat. Um, there's this Bayesian software out there called Beast. It stands for Bayesian Evolutionary Analysis Sampling Trees. And people use it for like phylogenetic analysis to infer things about, you know, when the most recent last common ancestor of different like genomes might have been. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, somebody's asking in the chat, like beast can take a really long time to fit. So could they theoretically, you know, rewrite a similar kind of model in Stan? and get some of those speed ups from HMC and the no U-turn sampler. Um, what do you think, Fayette? I have no experience whatsoever with these. So that is uh, as a starting point. I have no idea what, what the kind of models are. Um, my personal experience is that like, like Stan models are like fairly flexible in what you can, uh, what you can write down there, but they're also fairly, fairly quick to get explosive so like any 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 model that is massive in any other program is going to be massive in stan as well and so the translating i'm sure is going to be uh annoying at best um yeah i i know that for for the project that i'm working on uh with a COVID model we've had some some really annoying issues which is like matri matrices are just not dealt with the same way in stan as they are in r um, for example, in R, you can index backwards, right? So you could say like 10 to 1 uh, from a vector, and then it reverses the vector. Stan does not do that. Um, so there's all of these little things that just like, I don't know, make, make your life a little bit more difficult. Um, but coming back to, could you translate it into uh, Stan? I don't see a reason why you couldn't. Uh, I, think, I think it's a fairly... An, Ultimately, if you couldn't do it in our stand, you could write like the actual stand uh, code itself. Um, yeah. It said thanks. Any other questions?
I guess I have one question. Oh, wait, there's um, a few things in the chat. Weekly informative priors to be shown to me like. Since priors are related to the information available, would it be more from these priors that are somewhat related to the, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, prior, specifying priors is like a whole field into itself, uh, truly. Uh, there's there's quite a bit of uh, um, uh, variation into what people think is a reasonable prior to be specifying. Uh, Sorry, someone's unmuted. Um, and so I think ultimately uh, you have uh, even very vari variations in what a non-informative or weekly informative prior is, right? So I could specify a uh, a normal center around uh, zero with just like a very uh, with a variance of a hundred for a regression coefficient, um, but I could also just knowing the scale of the data and um, I could also say like, well, no, that is that is way too uh, broad and that's just not specific enough. I could have an, a normal of 0, 10. But the difference between a, a, a normal 0, 100 and 0, 10 will completely depend on what data you are using, right? Uh, whether that is an informative prior or not. Um, and yeah, so I think if you are looking into using informative priors, um, it's definitely uh, uh, worthwhile to, uh, to to learn more about Bayesian statistics and particularly about the impact that uh, your priors are having uh, on your on your outcome. And um, so, an informative prior is useful if you're not having a lot of data, uh, uh, or if your uh, model is very complex. Keep in mind that that does mean that you are putting information into your model, and that is information in the prior distribution. And so that is that is the trade-off. It's like, to what extent are you going to believe the data, and to what extent are you going to believe your prior? I see. Thank, thanks for that. Five. With regard to time series, it's just the same with the lag indices. Yeah, time series time series are like fairly easy to implement into uh, into a stand model. Uh, there's quite elaborate uh, examples as well that you can find if you if you're interested in doing a time series model. Um, that will just give you a little gist of like how you would be implementing it. But it's 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 fairly straightforward where you're just using uh, yeah either lag indices or um, uh, yeah, just a vector that is just going over time and you're just like having the time vector uh, as a secondary vector as well. Can one implement constraints in the functions block? That's a good question. I don't know whether uh, you can con implement constraints in the function. I think so. I mean, if you're, if you're specifying a function, uh, and then within that function, there are again constraints. Yes, you can specify that. So again, for the functions that you're defining in the function block, you will need to, at the beginning of that function, specify what type of uh, values that function is expecting. And there again, you can specify constraints. Uh, let's see. I'm not sure if I've missed any more questions in the chat. Christian, you also had a question now. Yeah, I was gonna ask about, you know, I feel like 
probably I have this misplaced paranoia that often gets at me when I'm doing Bayesian type of work, which is, you know, is the model somehow misspecified in a way that it's causing the sampler to work poorly, like for whatever reason. And I feel like, you know, 99 times out of 100, that's incorrect. And I've made some more trivial mistake, like some kind of indexing mistake yeah. or some kind of, you know, I just made a typo somewhere or like I dropped a model term that I, you know, and it's causing everything to not work, right? And so I'm fitting my models, I'm getting these really weird results or maybe the results aren't converging or something. And I'm just wondering how you go about like, do you have kind of a set of best practices in your head for how you debug and diagnose those kinds of hairy issues where there's not a syntax error per se? So the Stan, you know, yeah. compiler isn't yelling at you, but you're looking at your results and you're like, these don't make any sense or the model's not converging. Um, yeah. So just how do you think about that? Yeah, I think, I mean, like, there's, there's the obvious ways of doing that, and that is just including a lot of print statements, right? So really, there is actual, actual ways like, that you can, within your model, also write down print statements. And then when you're running the stand uh, function call, you have this option of uh, verbose, and that will just, um, you actually have an option to, just, like, show every iteration, all the print statements, or every 10th iteration. And so that is that is particularly useful because that way, for example, for some particular values, you can actually see how they progress across iterations. So perhaps you see that, oh, it starts out all fine. And then, oh, this one particular value is going off track already, like in iteration two, meaning perhaps, and, and I think that's just a way that you can like find perhaps the, your actual coding errors, right? So like if that if that is what's, what's uh, at the heart of it, I do think that adding print statements and like being like letting that output into your uh, to, into your console is particularly useful. And then, I mean, the second the second part is just to really like scale down your model back to like the simplest version, uh, mm -hmm. where you where you know what you can expect and seeing whether that is actually happening. Second, uh, third um, option is to again instead of using uh, the priors or instead of using data, uh, using fixing uh, some of the parameters to a, a particular value uh, that is either known or uh, that you assume reasonable. Uh, and so that is an, another way that you can, again, find out whether perhaps it, your prior distribution was, uh, was the culprit here. Uh, and so like, oh, in, in, the, in the particular regression example, right? Like I could just like take out sigma as a, uh, as a parameter and just like say sigma is fixed at one mm -hmm. and that way I could see whether I've messed something up in the regression coefficients or the okay. reverse. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's that's the order of things that I would. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Cool, thank you. All right, well, if there aren't any more questions, I think we can wrap up. Sounds good. Yeah, I just wanna thank you again, Faya. It's been wonderful having you. Um, I'm sure all of our participants really enjoyed learning from you. So thank you very much. Welcome. Um, really quickly, uh, if you haven't signed up for our email list, I just want to put the link in the chat to our um, Qualtrics form, which you can find on our website. So anyway, have a good night, everybody.